Okay, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to talk tonight. Um, so this is a, quite an important topic. Uh, lots of people have been working very hard around the country to work towards elimination of hepatitis C, and we're definitely making good progress. And there's been lots of work in our region uh, as well for many people. And really, over, going back to 2015 is when we started getting set up to start to try and work towards elimination. So I'll talk a bit about some of the things that we have achieved. Still a lot of work to do, but give you a flavor of, of the things that we've been doing over the last few years. Uh, hopefully the slide will go forward. So just by way of background, uh, hepatitis C is a bloodborne virus. So it's transmitted by blood contact. In the UK, the most common cause of transmission is injecting drug use but it can be transmitted by blood transfusions, tattoos, unsterile medical procedures. And those are, are causes overseas, particularly blood transfusions, unsterile medical procedures. And it's an important infection because it causes inflammation in the, the liver or hepatitis that can progress on to cirrhosis and liver cancer and all the complications that come with that. And people who have hepatitis C, if, if they didn't receive tweet, uh, treatment, 20 to 30% of people will develop cirrhosis and then be at risk of all the complications. In addition to causing liver disease, uh, hepatitis C is associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease and reduced quality of life. And this was a study that uh, we did a couple of years ago showing that, that was supported by Liver North, the enhanced study, and I've presented on this before. But it, essentially, we found that uh, individuals with hepatitis C had dramatically lower um, levels of quality of life than the general population in, in all the domains um, of uh, quality of life scores. And importantly, if we treat hepatitis C, we can make people feel better, as well as reduce the risk of liver disease. Um, and, and importantly, now we have really good treatments for hepatitis C that can con cure the majority of people. So this is just one of the drugs, data for one of the drugs. We've got several drugs now uh, called Eclusa. 98% um, of people who we treat with this drug are cured. And it's a one tablet a day, 12 week course of treatment. So we now have the tools to be able to potentially eliminate this infection and, and cure everyone who's infected, provided we can diagnose those people and then get them onto treatment. And that's what we're trying to do, as I'll talk about uh, in a moment. Importantly, if we treat people with hepatitis C and we cure them, achieve sustained virological response, as it's called, where the, the virus is permanently eradicated, we can reduce mortality, liver complications like liver cancer, liver failure, etc. So you can see that the blue lines there are those people who are cured. Um, and they have much lower levels of mortality, liver-related mortality, need for transplant, liver failure, and hepatocellular cancer. So treating hepatitis C is a good thing. We can prevent people having uh, significant complications. And it does also improve uh, quality of life, as I've said. So because we have these medications available, the WHO has, um, has a policy to try and eliminate hepatitis C from the world by 2030. Clearly, this is a very ambitious task uh, for developing countries particularly. But in England and the UK, uh, we really have a very good chance of being able to eliminate by 2030. And really, we're actually trying to do it before then. And what we're trying to do, uh, or what the targets are, is to reduce deaths uh, and uh, from uh, hepatitis C-related disease by 65% by 2030 and reduce the number of new infections by 90%. And practically what we're, we're trying to achieve is diagnose 90% of cases and treat at least 80% of them. Those are the, some of the metrics that we're trying to work towards. So this is not eradication of a virus. We will try and do that in due course. This is trying to control the virus to get it to a very low level. And there's not many uh, viruses or bacteria that have actually been eliminated uh, from the world. So this is a real opportunity to, to do something very good to eliminate an infection. 
So how do we deliver treatment? Well, there are 22 networks uh, across the country that deliver hepatitis C treatment. They're called operational delivery networks. Uh, we uh, are number one at the top, of course. Um, so that's good they named us number one. Um, we're the Northeast and Cumbrian. Um, and each of these areas have a hub centre, so that the centre that organises delivery of treatment across the whole region. But it very much is a collaborative effort uh, with many, many providers and many people involved across the region. So our network uh, is probably one of the hardest networks in terms of uh, geography. So we have the largest geography of all the uh, networks and we have a lot of providers. So we're, we're we have a population of approximately 3.7 million. We have seven hospital tr trusts that have people who treat hepatitis C. We have 17 uh, drug service providers and seven prisons on our patch. So that's quite a lot of people to be coordinating, um, which has its challenges. But we're all working very well together um, with the aim of, of eliminating the infection. So one of the important things that's changed over the last few years is the simplification of the treatment pathway. So in the past, treatment was relatively complex. So we used um, treatments that were had significant side effects, a treatment called interferon, which made people feel rubbish, had a chance of cure rates uh, of only about 50%, and came with that quite complex treatment pathways. But with these new drugs, which are very well tolerated, and very safe and require limited monitoring. We've really done quite a dramatic uh, change in simplification of the pathway. So in the, in the past, they had multiple tests, multiple visits uh, before they were even diagnosed properly with the infection. And the whole system just wasn't, wasn't that efficient. But we have moved now to uh, basically test, treat and confirm cure uh, very quickly. And in the past, most people had treatment in the hospital setting, but now we're taking the hepatitis C treatment to, to the community. So we have clinics in many places in the community, drug and, and alcohol services, prisons. Uh, some places have mobile services where they have a, a van or a bus that goes around and, and treats hepatitis C. Um, prison services, homeless shelters, all sorts of places. And we also have machines that can diagnose active hepatitis C um, uh, immediately, point of care tests. So uh, a finger prick of blood can tell uh, if somebody has hepatitis C there and then. So there's a real opportunity to change the way we practice and, and treat people close to home. Uh, so that that's very much much changed uh, for the for the better, and also with this we can treat many more people with with uh, less resource effectively. So some of the things that we've done over over the years, I'm going to talk about. One of the first things is uh, treating the people that we know about, uh, because some people have been tested for hepatitis C years ago, maybe had an attempt at treatment or not. Um, so the, the first piece of work that we have done is to, to try and treat who we knew about. And so when we were setting up all these networks back in around 2015, uh, Public Health England provided us all with figures of estimated numbers of infections. And this is what they thought that we had in our region. Uh, so they thought that we'd had 9,000 people who'd had hepatitis C at some point in time, but of, of those, um, only six and a half thousand were actively infected at the, the this time uh, back in 2015. And they thought that we diagnosed about 60% of them and that 40% were undiagnosed. And injecting drug use was the most common reason for infection with about half of those people currently injecting and the other half uh, previously injecting. And the other cases were uh, People who'd never injected drugs may have, have got it from a blood transfusion or a tattoo or overseas um, if they were born in a country with high rates of the infection. But I have to say, these figures were somewhat plucked out of the air, I think. Um, the, the Public Health England people would say they carefully modelled it to work out what the, the prevalence of infection was. But the bottom line is we don't really know how many infections there were then. And being honest with you, we don't we still don't really know how many infections there are, but um, we're working on it. 
Um, so one of the first pieces of work that we did, and this was very innovative, we were the first region in the country to do this. Working with Public Health England, we um, had postcode data for all the people who were known to have uh, hepatitis C, and we matched that up with those people that we had treated. And largely we did this to try and work out where the infections were to set up clinics in the community to try and strategically uh, improve the services. And uh, you can see, I mean, the graphs, there's uh, the, the darker areas are, are higher rates of treated and untreated cases. Um, and, and we did use these maps to then say, oh, well, we need a, a clinic in this area, that area. Uh, and, and that was really quite useful. We also found that not surprisingly, people who live closer to a treatment service were much more likely to have received treatment and be cured than those who, who didn't. So there was there was some sense in, in trying to move clinics as, as close as possible to, to where the infections were. And since then, we've now treated uh, approximately three and a half thousand people in the region. And the data suggests that we get around 400 new cases per year. Now, they are not all cases that end up being chronic infection. About half of them will, will self-clear. And we do have some uh, reinfections in the, in the region. So what I'm really trying to say in a roundabout way is we've treated a lot of people. We, we think that we're making an impact on the infection, but we still don't know the number of people because not enough people are tested in the community for us to be able to accurately say and we don't know how accurate the original figures are but I will show you some data uh, later on that that does show the number of cases are falling in the community from from uh, some of the data that we have from there so this is one of the difficulties is um we we're you know trying to to work out how many people have got left to to treat so that's treating the people that we knew about. And we continue to do that. We have a, a tracker and tracer called Kate, who uh, has lists and lists of people who we uh, know have been affected at, at one point in time and is trying to track those people down. Not surprisingly, some of those who might have been diagnosed in 1995, it can be a bit tricky to track down if they've moved, et cetera. Um, but, but that's a good place to start with the people that we uh, know about. And then the next phase, of course, is trying to find those who are undiagnosed and then treating them. So there are guidelines uh, from NICE um, that suggest who should be tested for hepatitis B and C. And there's quite a lot of people that they suggest should be tested. So anyone who's ever injected drugs, even if only once in their life, is at risk. People who've received a blood transfusion uh, particularly before 1991, when they started screening blood for hepatitis C. Prior to that, they didn't, didn't know what the virus was. They couldn't test for it. Or if people have received blood transfusions overseas, there's an increased risk. Some countries have a quite a high prevalence of hepatitis C. So if anyone was born or brought up in a country with a prevalence of more than 2%, it's recommended that they are tested. Uh, babies born to mothers who've had hepatitis C, people in prison, looked after children, people who live in homeless hostels or on the streets, HIV men who have sex with men, and anyone that's been a close contact of someone infected with hepatitis C. So all these people are recommended to have testing. And where, where should this be done? So the drug services uh, should be offering testing uh, to all service users and then offer annual testing thereafter for those people at risk of infection. And in primary care, they should be doing the same. And they should be specifically assessing somebody's risk of having hepatitis C when they, or hepatitis B for that matter, when they register for uh, at the practice. And then again, offering annual testing. But I can tell you, tell you, this just does not happen. So where do we offer testing? So there's lots of testing going on now in the region in various places. So addiction services are now reasonably good at testing. Prisons, as I'll show you data on this, have improved immensely over the years and now doing pretty well. Custody suites, uh, we've done a, an innovative uh, program there, uh, which successfully tested people. Community pharmacies, we've done some work there. We've done some testing on a, on a bus, uh, mobile testing. 
So these are some of the areas that we've gone out to try and test in in uh, innovative environments to try and um, find people who may be at risk. It all sounds very easy, um, but actually testing people for hepatitis C isn't always as straightforward as one might think. So, um, and testing is well below desirable levels in, in many of the services, particularly primary care. And any attempts that we have done to improve testing in primary care have been uh, not well, uh, well, they failed essentially. And there are some barriers. So there are healthcare barriers, and then there's client or patient barriers. So uh, healthcare barriers, testing for hepatitis C uh, is not a high priority for some people. Uh, we think it should be a high priority because we can diagnose people and cure people and stop them getting liver disease. But others uh, in, in primary care have other priorities that they think may be more important. There is a lot of stigma around um, hepatitis C still um, because of its connotations with drug use. And, um, and that does not that really doesn't help in promoting testing. There are fears from healthcare providers about having inadequate knowledge to answer questions. But I would argue that there are many people who can answer those questions them very easily. Um, and that should not stop us testing people when we know they can easily be cured with a very straightforward uh, treatment. And in the past, there were long waits for test results and treatment in the community, but that is just not the case now. If someone's diagnosed today in primary care, they will get seen either in my clinic or a nurse-led clinic the next week um, because we want to get people uh, treated as quick as possible. Um, and then there's some client barriers. So people, there's fear and misinformation out there. So people uh, maybe don't want to be tested because they've heard, oh, it's it's terrible. The treatment is interferon treatment that we used years ago that poisons people and this and that. So um, word hasn't necessarily got out to everyone that this is very uh, straightforward to treat. And some people who are at risk, hepatitis C really isn't a priority for them. If they're actively using drugs, that that may not be their their priority to to have treatment for something that may um, help them in in a few years' time. But at the moment, their their next priority is is uh, you know getting their next meal or um, a roof over their head, etc. Um, and some people may be uh, in a chaotic phase of injecting drug use that that we know can happen, and those people may not be quite ready for treatment. But we need to come overcome all these um, barriers and test as many people because treatment is very straightforward now. Another area that we've done a lot of work in the Northeast and again being very pioneering is in prisons. And the importance of hepatitis C in the prison setting is that it is much more common in prison than the general population. So it's around 20 times more common. Um, data from the UK suggests about 7% of inmates um, uh, across the UK have had hep C at some point in their time. Some will have self-cleared. And in a large proportion, around two-thirds of people have uh, injected drugs in the previous year because drug-related crime is a very common reason to go to prison. And hep C can be transmitted in the prison setting through assault, sharing of toothbrushes, razors, tattoos, etc. And certainly in the past, um, very few people were actually tested it in the prisons. So when we started doing work in around 2013, 14 in uh, the Northeast prisons, only 3% of people were tested, uh, despite there being this high uh, prevalence. But I'll show you, we've, we've had a big impact on that. So um, starting back back then, uh, we tried to do something about this. So we wanted to increase testing rates in, in prison and then offer an effective treatment. So um, it took a while to set up, but we initially began a pilot in March of 2016 in HMP Durham, which is the main remand prison in the Northeast where people are awaiting court. Um, so everyone who came into the prison was to be offered uh, testing for all the bloodborne viruses, but particularly hepatitis C uh, at reception. And then we, uh, well, piloted using telemedicine in HMP Northumberland to treat the patients. 
Um, back then, telemedicine was actually quite innovative. I mean, everyone uses it now since COVID, but back uh, when we did this work, hardly anyone was using it. So we offered people using dry blood spot testing, which you can see there, they get a prick in the finger, squeeze a, a dot of blood onto the card and the card can analyze for all the bloodborne viruses and tell whether someone's got active infection. So in this work, we then offered uh, the, a test to around two thirds of people and about a third of people accepted. So in this pilot, that was 1500 people. And then we diagnosed 47 cases, which was 3%. So that was a dramatic increase in testing compared to the 3% testing prior to that. And we continued to do uh, plenty work on this over the, over the years, as I'll show you in a moment. So then around about 2020, we, we by this time, it, the pathway had been rolled out to all seven prisons and was working uh, quite well. So we reviewed it at this point in time around 2020. At this point, we tested 8,500 people and 7% of people uh, were hep C antibody positive, having had the infection at some point in time. And 4.4% of the total population had active hepatitis C infection. And of those people, we'd started 71% of people on treatment. And then some people had, had left the prison before they were able to be started on treatment because uh, quite a lot of people who have drug-related crime at, at relatively short sentences. So there wasn't always time to get the people diagnosed and started on treatment. But uh, this system certainly works well, uh, as I'll show you, and we treat a lot of people in prison. And this is work that we're just writing up at the moment. So we've been evaluating this testing and treatment program in the Northeast prisons for the last five years. So this uh, data is... Uh, is very good. I'm just going to have to move the faces away so I can see the data on the right here. Um, so this this is looking at testing over the five years. You can see uh, by year the numbers. So in total, there have been 39,652 people who've gone into three of the northeast prisons in this time, and 83% of people have had an offer of a test, and around 61% uh, of people have actually had their test completed. Uh, which is good. And remarkably, we've diagnosed 1,766 cases, or overall 8.7% uh, of these three prisons. It's a slightly different figure than uh, data for the whole seven prisons, uh, because we've just focused on, on the prisons with, with higher rates for this work. But so, some other important uh, it, oops, important thing. So if you look at the number of people actually having the test, the good news in the last uh, full in the last full year, uh, you can see that the rates of, of testing has gone up uh, to 76%. So 76% of people coming into the prison were tested, which is good. Um, so that increase is good. But also we are seeing lower rates of infection. Uh, so it's been falling over the years. And I think that is good in that that suggests that people who are going, the, the rates of infection of people going into the prison is falling, which fits with the fact that we've been treating a lot of people in the community. So I think this is a, a measure to say that, that the prevalence in the community is falling. It's just one of the measures that we can use to look at that. So overall, uh, promising, but we've still got a heck of a lot of people uh, to treat and, and still a high rate of infection, so a lot more to do. The other thing that we've done in the prison setting, which again is very interesting, is the, uh, the so-called high intensity test and treat events. So we've done three of these in the Northeast. Um, this was the first one we did in Low Newton prison. So Low Newton is, uh, an all-female prison uh, just outside Durham, um, or in Durham, really. Uh, and in one weekend, almost every uh, resident of this prison was tested. So 99% of people were tested. And remarkably, 32% of people had uh, a positive hepatitis C antibody, uh, indicating they've had infection at some point in time, and 8% had active hepatitis C. And you may say, my goodness, that's such a high rate. Well, female prisons uh, do tend to have a higher rate of um, hep C than, than male prisons, because often uh, 
uh, drug-related crime uh, is a common reason for, uh, or a more common reason relatively for incarceration among females than males. Um, and essentially we've treated everyone who was diagnosed uh, positive in this event. And since then, there've been two other of these uh, events in the much larger prisons, uh, the prison in Teesside and Durham. And again, about 98% of people have been uh, tested and um, the majority of those people have been treated. The one we've just finished in Durham, we're, we're still awaiting the results of how many positives and then we'll get them treated. And this offers the opportunity to so-called micro-eliminate a prison. So if you, if you treat, test almost everyone, treat everyone that's positive, and then you keep the rate of testing very high of people going into the prison, then effectively, effectively we can eliminate uh, from that prison. And there have been a number of prisons around the country that have uh, successfully micro-eliminated. But one of the problems or risks about uh, hepatitis C, of course, is, is reinfection. And this is one of the things that can perpetuate the infection. And this is why that we have to treat more and more people. If we treat more and more people, then actually reinfection rates fall because even if people do share uh, injecting uh, equipment, they, that they the risk of transmission is, is lower in that setting. So we've looked at this in our region. We had... Um, 788 patients who had achieved a cure of the infection and of those just over half of them 443 people had had testing up after the time point that they were uh, cured and of these 12.6 percent of people had a hepatitis c reinfection um, and this this is a high rate um, and this really does suggest that a failure in the system uh, of harm reduction, so provision of uh, needle uh, and syringe equipment. And really, this is something that must be improved in the community. And one of the things that has been, the funding has been cut for dramatically over the last few years is things like uh, harm reduction, and, um, and that's disappointing. So we must improve harm reduction. We must treat more people educate people about risks of, of reinfection. Otherwise, this is going to put our elimination efforts back somewhat. But what can we do about it? So this is, again, something very innovative, the first of its kind in the in the northeast or from the northeast. Uh, so we are doing a, a currently in collaboration with the Hepatitis C Trust. We're doing a test and trace program using peer workers. So these are people who have lived experience of hepatitis C, who uh, have, I guess, much more credibility in the community than we do. And they're approaching individuals who may uh, have a recent hepatitis C infection or a reinfection and inviting them to bring friends or associates forward for testing. So this is a pilot. This is nine months of work that's been done. And Mark, who uh, our peer worker who's leading this, has done lots of great work on this. So he approached 241 uh, people. Um, these are sort of index cases, so people who we've uh, recently diagnosed with hepatitis C, uh, who we think is a reinfection or a new infection. And about half of those people agreed to bring forward uh, contacts. In fact, Quite a lot of people accepted, but not so many people brought contacts forward, but 24 people brought contacts forward. So that's 20 percent um, of those people who accepted the invitation. And of those 88 people have been tested. But remarkably, of those 88 people, 33 or 38 percent of those people have got active hepatitis C. So this is is a very effective way of finding people who uh, maybe wouldn't have been found by standard uh, testing. So this is something we're continuing to do. There's a lot of work to increase the uptake. Um, and then we're working through making sure all the people get um, treated. So still work in progress, but definitely something that it look, looks promising and we need to continue, especially as we get closer and closer to elimination. So what's happening UK wide? So this is some data from uh, the UK Health and Sec Health Security Agency, which used to be Public Health England, 
Um, so this is data for the whole of, of the UK rather than just England. So they think there's about 100,000 cases of hepatitis C left. It's believed to be less than that in England, around 70 or 80,000, and it may be less than that. Uh, but again, these figures are extrapolated from uh, modeling data and none of us are entirely sure whether these figures are correct or not, but they're the best we've got. But encouragingly, you can see in the graph on the right, the, the number of cases uh, is, um, that's the, the bottom bit, the light bars, uh, is falling and the percentage of, of the population who are um, at risk is falling. So that's good. So just to conclude, um, so we've made significant progress towards elimination of hepatitis C, but there's still a lot to do. There are many barriers to overcome, but we're working hard on solutions to them all. And I think lots of good solutions have been made so far, but lots more to do. But really importantly, the potential of eliminating an infection is a once in a lifetime opportunity. So we must motivate as many people as possible to play their part in hepatitis C elimination. And any little part, just promoting hepatitis C testing, any little part uh, is a really important uh, thing to do to, to help get uh, us eliminating this infection. Uh, so that is all I have. I'll stop sharing my screen and we can have some questions if I can work out how to stop sharing. There we That's are. It. <clears throat> Brilliant. That's excellent, Stuart. Thank you. What an interesting talk. And um, I didn't even know what was going on. <laughs> we, um, <clears throat> what are, um, for questions, if you would like to ask a question, could you either raise your hand like this or your virtual hand, and then we'll uh, we'll we'll get uh, uh, Dr. McPherson to answer them in turn. Right. Uh, Right, um, Catherine, you'll have to you'll have to um, unmute yourself. Do you know how to do it? We have to find your little microphone. Can't right. see you. Yeah, there you are. It's working now. Oh, is it working? Yeah, oh, it's, it's working now. <laughs> I'm just saying, Dr. McPherson, thank you for that. That was really interesting. Um, could um, hepatitis C not be identified identified in any blood sample in general? So um, you have to do a specific test, but what one of the things we're hoping to start very soon is anyone that turns up to A and E and has mm -hmm. any blood test done for anything will automatically have a hepatitis C test. Um, so they've implemented that in London and they have picked up a lot of cases, not just of hepatitis C, but of hepatitis B and and also of HIV. So that's something that we think would be be good. I mean, it does it does produce a lot of work uh, for labs and things like that. And the test is relatively expensive, but it's well, well worth doing, we think. Mm -hmm. um so that's going to be one of the things that we're doing over the next year um mm -hmm. and the same thing in gp practices um there could be flags alerts on gp records to flag somebody up with testing if i'm honest the work we've tried in in primary care just hasn't worked um mm -hmm. so far and mm -hmm. you would know, put a lot of effort into one project in a gp practice and manage to test mm -hmm. three people and you know, you think it was weeks of work to get test three people. So um that's that's a harder sell. I know, I know what you mm. mean. I know. Okay, right. Thanks for that, Catherine. Um Yvonne, I think next. Yes, yeah, Stuart, I echo uh, what Catherine's just said there. And and in 10 years, I've been part of the what an amazing advance is, uh, I've seen and you your, your slides were brilliant tonight. I just wonder, though, Stuart, in terms of prevention, bearing in mind the damage that can be done by having hepatitis C, um, it, the, the work done in sort of preventing it in the first place, I know uh, it, it, if there's something that's easily cured, and it looks to be as if it's quite easily cured, 
then maybe people are, are not that bothered about, oh, well, I get it, I can take a tablet and I'm sorted. So I just wonder if there's any work being done in prevention or if you could yeah. mm. um, any way that, that we could be seen to prevent it more. I'm thinking in schools or, you know, generally anyway. I agree. Yeah, so I think that's a very good question. So I think you're right. The treatment now is very easy. So the consequences of the infection, if someone uh, does have a reinfection or retreatment is, is straightforward. Um, in the past, when we used interferon, I mean, people had a real tough time, a year's worth of treatment. And if they did reinfect, then the consequences of having to have another course of interferon um, you know, were, were significant. Having said that, actually, a lot of people who had interferon did un end up having uh, some reinfections if they were, if they were at risk. I, I think you're right. The, it's harm reduction advice um, is really important. Provision of clean needles um, it is something that that is very important. Education, um, but I, I the the services the drug services have been cut back and cut back and cut back so dramatically that this is not really been as much of a priority. And I think the staff there do try, but actually giving proper advice takes quite a long time going through because injecting drugs is quite a complex process and there's plenty. I mean, I, 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 you have know, heard all about this. And so somebody that really knows what they're doing uh, in terms of talking people through all the risk points can have a really big impact, but that takes a lot of time and, Sometimes perhaps it's again, it's not people's priority. If if they're desperate for a hit, for want of better words, um, they cut corners because they need it very quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the concepts of treat if you treat everyone is so-called treatment as prevention. If we treat enough people so that there's no infections in the community, then actually the risk of infection is low. Um, and that's that's something that uh, obviously we're, we're trying to work towards. But the two things have to go together. Prevention, I completely agree. But it, it's just been. Yeah, it, it, there has not been enough focus on, on that. And it's been all about prescribing these drugs, which which work very well. Uh, and that's been forgotten, despite some of us trying to say, let's try and make this more important. Yeah, that all right, Yvonne? Yeah, it's it's, yeah. Again, it's all it's all about money and um well, yes. it is uh Fiona, you're next, I think. And then Joan. <clears throat> Hi, sorry, I don't think I can work out how to put my camera back on. Sorry. All right. Mm -hmm. Um <laughs> um thank you, Stuart. That was really interesting. I'm just wondering what is happening to get the word out about how curable Pepsi is now. Um, and not just with, um, you know, with health providers, but also with the general public. So the, the the stuff that's less targeted on particular kinds of people. I mean, again, I don't think it's been as good as as it should be. I think it'd be ideal for th things like on the metro, you know, mm -hmm. having um, get tested, get treated. I mean, there's been some publicity in the media, particularly around the infected blood inquiry. There were that raised a bit of profile about hepatitis C, but it's still not publicized as much as it should. Um, and, and I think we are going to need that because there will be a significant number of people in primary care who may have been infected perhaps in the 70s, you know, uh, <laughs> the good old 70s where there was lots of drug use. People may have only used once at a party. But actually, those people will be at significant risk of uh, advanced liver disease now. So there'll, there'll be people who who are at risk. And the only way we find that is is by good publicity. I mean, some GP practices will have uh, posters up. But again, it's I, I agree. I think a proper national um, advertising campaign would be a good thing. But but again, someone's got to pay for that. Mm. So. So, I mean, I'm just thinking of the the you know the the adverts around um, HIV, around the fact that untransmittable, um, uh, sorry, undetectable and undetectable viral load means that you don't transmit HIV. 
and that you know they've been I live in London so I've seen the adverts on bus stops and wherever and I don't I'm trying to think if I've seen anything for HCV and I don't remember anything actually mm -hmm. Well, you hit the nail on the head. HIV is one of the most overfunded areas. Uh, hepatitis C funding has been far, far less than that. And it's interesting, the uh, emergency department testing thing that I talked about. So they managed to diagnose 30. They did tested thousands of people in a &E. They managed to diagnose 13 cases of uh, HIV versus hundreds of cases of hepatitis B and hepatitis C. And then when they they got some minister coming along to to talk about it, they took the uh, the minister to the HIV unit, which had palm trees and all sorts, the most beautiful environment, lovely funded uh, place. Then they went to the Hep C unit, which is in this derelict building, uh, and it it just some areas seem to get funded much more. And I think HIV is one of those that it is. It is well promoted and hepatitis C has suffered more from this stigma um, that the HIV hasn't suffered with as much or has overcome. I'm not saying there isn't stigma, but they've managed to overcome the stigma more so than hepatitis C, I think. Um, but you're right. A decent advertising campaign is absolutely what's needed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's excellent. You're, you're just about blocked out, Stuart. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm go. I'm in the front room. I'll need to turn the light on, or I'll just okay. go next to the window where uh, <laughs> there's light. Okay. Oh no, that'll be even worse. I'll turn the light on. Why don't <laughs> I? Right. So the next um, question is uh, Joan. You you're the next. And then Alf. Did you have your hand up, Alf? Yeah, Joan. Now then. Yeah, I was just uh, wondering what the uh, implications are of testing everyone in A and E. Uh, on insurance, um, sit, uh, well, on the insurance situation, because as I understand it, you have to disclose whether you've been tested or not, uh, and you don't have to. No, you don't have to disclose you've been tested. If you if you had active hepatitis C, you would have to disclose it, but um, but then we would have test cured you by then. So. I, Oh, well, that's reassuring. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. certainly the, my time on the ethics committee, when people were um, being tested for various things, it was you had to declare it on. It could affect your insurance. Um, so that's good to know that it doesn't. <laughs> yeah, and and mo most of the the system, the way it works in in London, basically everyone gets tested uh, if they have a blood sample. There's posters up explaining it all. And uh, and then people get sent word that the test is negative. If the test is positive, they get a personal phone call by somebody that knows what they're talking about. And then they're brought basically into a clinic that week or the next week to make it really quick. And then they're straight on to treatment so that there's no hanging about waiting for 18 weeks or however many weeks for, for an appointment. It, if you're doing something like that, it has to be instantaneous that people see somebody and are started on treatment. Otherwise, you know, and it'd be very uh, anxiety provoking being told you've got something you've got to wait for a long time. But, um, Alf? You're muted, Alf. You'll have to unmute. Right. There you go. Thank you very much, actually, for that talk. It's it's remarkable indeed how a good news story indeed this is. I mean, how much, how you do, how things have developed since 20, 2019. The fact that there's been so much innovative work, the toolkit you've now, now got of drugs, etc., which can cure this and relatively quickly. It seems to me all the ducks are lined up, so to speak, but yet it's a tremendous good news story out there. And I, I don't know how you actually get the good news story out, you know, in terms of in this part of the world, look north or something like that should be picking this up. But uh, when you look at other diseases and you see how they're struggling, yeah, here you've actually got the solutions. Um, so more power to your elbow, however you're going to achieve that. But it's a great news story. Mm -hmm. That's kind well of you to say. Uh, so now it's uh, Sean, I think. I think it's Sean. You've got an S for your name. It is Sean, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Stuart. That was just so interesting and um, fascinating to hear all the different ways in which you're trying to tackle the problem. It was making me think that 
in terms of getting information out, it's trying to think where if most people are IV drug users, I was trying to think of places where mm. IV drug users mm. might be so that you could target where the information was. And perhaps that might not be GP surgeries. <coughs> so I was, I was thinking about um, the shops boxes that people are given, mm. whether you could get the companies to put something on the shops boxes themselves as like an advert. Then I was also thinking, um, one of my pharmacy is a pharmacy that does uh, methadone. And I often go early in the morning to the pharmacy. So I hang around outside with people who are coming to have methadone who might also be still using IV. And I was thinking outside pharmacies where we're all hanging around waiting to get in. Not that I'm an IV drug user, but um, that might be another place. So that, so I could have showed you, we've been to pharmacies actually, I could have shown you some data on that. So, but you're absolutely right. That's a perfect group of people to target those who are um, picking up their methadone every day because they turn up to the pharmacy. So we did do a pilot in about eight pharmacies. It was very variable, the uptake. So we had some really successful pharmacies, the one in South Shields called Carter's that tested everyone. They've tested everyone now. They're on the third round of testing them and they managed to get every single person who they had on methadone tested. But then there were others that we just for reasons I still don't understand would not test. We gave them the, all the, we spent an enormous amount of work. We education packages for them all. We sat them down, we had pathways sorted. We gave them all these tests. There was incentives. So the pharmacist was gonna be paid for every test they did. Uh, the person who was tested was gonna get an incentive, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and some of them just would, wouldn't test. And I, I don't know whether it's a fear issue of, or maybe doing a blood test and getting, I, I just don't know. Sue, I'm going to ask Sue why she thinks pharmacists don't, because Sue's uh, is has worked uh, a lot more in around uh, the region than, than I have in terms of uh, hepatitis C. So it's got lots of insights into on the ground working. What do you think, Sue? Thank you. To be honest, I want I think they want them in and out as quick as they can. We do have a lot of peer workers who work for the Hepatitis C Trust uh, and they do really well. I think that makes a big difference when you get a, a, chem a chemist who is on board and buy into what we do. Um, and it all depends on the chemist as well. Um, but a lot of them, I mean, feedback from a lot of people who use the chemists, it, they feel very judged going in. They feel like they don't, you know, it's um, they get told, don't be touching anything. Don't be looking at anything. Just come. They get segregated, don't they, anyway? I mean, if they go in lap, you know, they have to wait last if they're going to a chemist. The stigma is horrendous for people who use drugs. It really is. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, we work really, really hard to try and overcome the challenges and the stigmas. And um, when you were saying about um, the news and things like that, um, there is actually World Hepatitis Day, it's 28th of July. Um, and it's national. I mean, we have um, our parliamentary team. Uh, we've been to we've been to Westminster promoting hepatitis C. We've done. There is a lot of stuff, but um, a lot of the general public um, looked. It's looked at as you know, it's a drug user's disease, um, and a lot of people think they deserve it anyway. You know, and there's a lot of judgment. Um, sorry, I could rant on forever. Uh, I was <laughs> I was dying to chip in, and a good job I was on mute because every time someone asked a question, I was dying to you know chip in. But yeah, um, but pharmacies, yeah, I think you need a specific peer worker to be honest, because um, people when when they've got that lived experience, more likely to 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 have a test. I mean, McCarthy's. I think was it McCarthy's what done in Sunderland the chemist Car Carter's. Yeah, I mean they were brilliant. Really, really good. And you know what? It just depends. It's a look at the draw where you go. Really. That's mm. good. Mm. Well, thanks, thanks for that, uh, Thank Sue. Thank you. Um, have you finished? Yeah, Sean's finished. Yvonne now. 
you your hands up. You'll have to unmute Yvonne. Sorry, there uh, you go. Just Hi. Follow on there from the um, the point about the chemists and and, and the the availability of tests. Can I suggest that you might think about um, or someone might think about food banks and soup kitchens? Because I know that having worked in soup kitchens, I know Michael has uh, uh, worked in soup kitchens before. There are a lot of people who do come to soup kitchens who are drug users or have been drug users or have been in prison and all of those things. And that is somewhere else that sort of, as you know, they're not picking their methadone up, they're not in a chemist, they're not in a sort of a, a medical environment. And you could have an environment where they might, you know, they might be sitting having a chat with someone, et cetera, et cetera. So just, just, uh, you might have tried it, uh, Sue, but um, uh, just something to consider as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank, well, thanks for that, Yvonne. Um, we uh, did, a, I've, I've got a couple of questions for you, Sue, if that's all right. We, oh, uh, should we just uh, we could just answer that one because I think uh, our nurses are going there tomorrow as that happens. Um, but Sue will know better than me exactly. It's this week sometime because Caroline told me that today. I think they're going to start. Got about ten people who they think they're going to try and start on treatment there who've been trying to track down. A lot of the work is tracking people down yeah. uh, who we know about already. And I think, uh, but Sue, you might want to comment more about that. Yeah, we actually um, got one to kitchens um, in in this area because I'm, I'm based in Middlesbrough. So in Middlesbrough, Stockton, um, we go to all the soup kitchen. We go to the we, um, like on a Tuesday. I go to the Salvation Army do testing um, with James Cook. Um, we go to the evening stuff where they call Connect Community. So it's like a Christian organisation where they've gone and they feed the homeless. Um, we do a lot of testing in Stockton, um, it's in Newcastle, Gateshead, um, all over really. And I just want to give you an, a, a, like just a, a quick, um, we did a testing event in Middlesbrough at, um, a, it's like a soup kitchen. And we actually found a lady who'd been um, infected as a baby. Um, all right, good. Yeah, so, um, and she only got tested, so she, because she took some homeless people there, and she only got tested, so she could give them the, the Greg's voucher, and it, out of the 30 people who tested, she was the one who was infected. Right. She's being treated now. So, yeah, we do hostel hits, we go around all the hostels, anywhere where you can think of where there'll be people who use drugs, we go, and we also um, go to... Sainsbury's car parks, we do testing, general public. Um, we'll, we'll, you know, we've got the Melissa bus, so we're in Cumbria. So it's going to, you know, packed up at shopping centres and we're going to test everybody. And we do fibro scans as well at the same time. So it's we, it's not only, like Stuart had said, it's not only for people who, who, who use drugs. It is predominantly, but not, not only that way. So, yeah, anywhere you can think of, I bet you would be... Yeah, I was just, and we'll be going again. Yeah, I was just wondering in terms of Sunderland. Do you know what I mean? You've talked about Middlesbrough, you've talked about Newcastle there and Cumbria, but I just wonder about Sunderland. That's where I'm sort of that's where I live. Um again it might be down to obviously the different areas. Are you losing your voice your um, your sound, Yvonne? Right. Sorry. Yes, I was just saying, Sue, that I come from Sunderland and I haven't picked up anything from Sunderland. You've talked about Middlesbrough there in Newcastle. So could it be that it just depends which part of the northeast that you come from? But um, No, because I, I manage the whole of the northeast and Cumbria. So we go, we're in, we go every year, we go in all the areas. Apart, well, I mean, we're limited because we've only got you know, a limited number of staff, but we've got some, we've got mm. 17 volunteers. I think we've got three, four paid staff, um, one based, one's Mark, who Stuart spoke about for the reinfections. Um, <coughs> so yeah, we do, we, we go to all the, we've been to Poplar House, One Lodge, um, 
the, all the usual places in Sunderland. But what you, what we do, we go on like a three month um, rolling because it can because somebody can have um, it can take three months for an infection to come out on somebody. So what we try and do is all you know on a like a rolling system. So we have workers. I have a, a specific worker in Middlesbrough Stockton. Hartley Pool down into the Tees Valley area and every three months they do the rounds of all the, the hostels and we do the same Sunderland, Newcastle, Gateshead. Um, we are, you know, we're on our way up to Blyde. I mean, we haven't even touched Blyde, like Annick or, you know, them areas because, you know, we're limited to what we can do. What I mean, yeah. less than the nurses, there isn't loads of them, you know, and the proper grafters. You know, it's it really it 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 is it's it's a it's a massive task. It really, really is. And you think people would you think there's your tablets? Why don't you take them? It's not as easy as that. I no. mean, find somebody with with a phone, right, and keep the same number. I mean, we've even come to we even give out SIM cards. We give out phones to give to people, and they can have it one day and gone the next. You know, and it's like. Sometimes we'll get a name given, a date of birth, no area, you know, of release from prison. We have to go and find them, hunt them down. It's like finding a needle in a haystack. And then when you find them, they might not even want treatment. Yeah. It's That's good. It really is. It certainly isn't easy. Yeah. We're, we're, yeah. Got a question from Linda. You've got your hand up, Linda. There you go. Thank you, Stuart, for a really interesting uh, talk. As Alf said, it is a good news story, which uh, we all like to hear. And thank you, Sue, for your um, input to the talk as well, answering questions. Um, I just wondered whether or not among the hostels and prisons, places that you visit, whether or not you include um, refuges. Because though you said drug users are predominantly the people who get HIV and um, hepatitis C, um, also it's passed on via blood and therefore by assaults. And quite often people in refuges, that's the reason they're in there because they've been assaulted, um, maybe physically or mentally. So that might be one area that you could also um, visit if you have the resources. But also, uh, would it be worth putting out flyers, say, in pharmacies and GP surgeries, in the hospitals, in outpatients, clinics, etc. So while people are waiting, that you have a, a read about this brilliant good news story and how easy it appears to be to treat hepatitis C. Sorry, that was a few questions in one. Yeah, that's good. So in terms of refuges, definitely, uh, I mean, very important. Um, like Sue says, it, we're trying to pick off the highest um, impact areas, but absolutely. I think waiting rooms, yeah, I mean, the wait for the outpatients in Freeman is usually quite long. We could even have someone offering tests in the corner of the clinic. Um, we, I mean, we we aren't doing that currently, but that's something to consider. Um yeah, just general promotion. I mean, one of the things that we've noticed in the hospital is more and more people are being diagnosed as they come into hospital with, you know, abscesses or whatever potential complications and orthopedics and people are actually doing hep C tests now, diagnosing the patients and they go home uh, with on treatment. So I think the wider uh, healthcare professionals are waking up to the fact that this is um is worth testing for still more work to do but it's definitely improving that's good thanks for that good and linda um john i was just gonna um go on from what uh, you've just been saying about getting getting the word out there uh, and i know you're very busy um is there any chance that you could do a little write-up for the newsletter uh, or a poster or whatever um and spread the word that way we can sort something for you for sure. Um, right. It's uh, yeah. We could talk about exactly what you want. I mean, we can just. I think really simple, uh, almost. Yeah, get tested, get treated. A message. Yeah, we can yeah. do something for that. And it works. 
So that's yeah. that's uh, yeah. We're more than willing to help. What I what I wanted to ask you about was um, the test itself. Is it simple? Is it easy? And can anyone do it, or do you need a clinician to do it and administer it, or a nurse? So you know, we it, we can do um, we can do COVID testing at home now in quarter of an hour. So there, there we do have home testing kits. So we do try and uh, send them out to people. So uh, that that's definitely something. I mean, it's a little bit fiddly, but it, it's one of those things that people can do at home, definitely, uh, and then post them back if necessary. There is going to be a national um, so-called web testing portal, a bit like the COVID site that I'm sure you've all been on to order yeah. your COVID tests. Yeah. Um, I think on the 1st of April, they're launching one for hepatitis C, and there will be a bit of publicity around that. And it'll be a similar thing. You can send out a testing kit, send it back, get the results. Uh, and obviously, if any positives get notified to the local uh, Hep C team, will then contact people a bit like happened in COVID. Um, I don't think any of us really know how successful that's going to be. Um, it is a pilot of something. So I guess if it's not being used, it may be something that doesn't continue for that long. Um, so that that will be something that's going a national thing but we've used these locally um not only to to diagnose people in the first place but to um tell them the outcome of the treatment so if someone lives in i don't know bishop auckland and they're a bit away from a treatment service um the option for them is to have the confirmatory blood test done three months after the treatment to see whether they're cured they can do it at home and then post it to us and we can tell them the result to save them having to come to a clinic. So, um, yeah, and these tests are evolving. They're becoming uh, better and better. But, yeah, a wee bit dexterity is required, but that they can be done in, in the own home. Sorry, that's okay, a long so, ramble. So can we help by um, making the tests available, but, you know, distributing them for you, or is that just something you've got to do from the centre? So that, yeah, I guess publicising. Yeah. Helping us publicise that people can have a test and here's where you get it would be really helpful. We, we, um, yeah. Well, we can certainly do that. And and um, the, the other one is, um, does the hepatitis C test also show hepatitis B? So it depends which one you do. Um, right. So, um, yeah, a lot of them, you can do all of them in one go. And I would argue that you should never test for one virus in isolation um, because the three viruses are blood-borne viruses. So um, it's worth testing for all three. Yeah. And they found that in London, actually, they set the thing up to test for HIV was the main reason they set up. And as I said, they got 13 of those and then hundreds of hep B and hep C. So if they hadn't tested for hep B and C, they would have missed all those diagnoses. So yeah. we should test for all three where possible. OK, and you mentioned the Southern Asian population are more prevalent to it. We we um, a few years ago, it's a long time ago now, with Maggie Bassendine. You remember Professor Maggie Bassendine? We yeah, ran, yeah. Oh, I was involved in that too. Yeah, uh, we yeah. ran the, the hepatitis B tests at the Chinese Healthy Living Centre. And, we, you know, do you want to do that again? Because if that's going to reveal hepatitis B and C, and they lined up in their hundreds to get tested. They certainly did. And we also tested for hep C when we went to the South Asian community in Sunderland. And we didn't actually pick up that much hep C in that one. But... Uh, that's definitely something to, uh, yeah, that's definitely something to keep in our back pocket. I think for the moment we we've, we've probably got quite a lot of places we need to go. And all uh, right, okay, because we'd it, we'd be prepared to get involved again and okay. and fund well, it. You know, good. we could we could probably fund okay. it. Uh, and the Healthy Living Centre is a brilliant place to do it at uh, Blandford Street, and uh, not Blandford Street, but Stowell Street. Yeah. Um, that's right. So that was that was quite uh, something, and then the other thing is that I just wanted to say we've been going a long time, as you know, and we've had people with hepatitis C who've been in Liver North, and they, um, if they're infected, and they, in at one time once you got it, you kept it for the rest of your life, and we, you know, the the cure was a nightmare. There were people who couldn't hold their concentration, 
they had poor memory and they they couldn't they were they were um below par mentally if you like because of the hepatitis c we think we don't know but what i'm going to say is this if you've got people who have hepatitis c who have the same symptoms as the people we knew long long ago they're probably not going to hold it together enough to know about having taken the tablets and get being cured you know it's an ideal thing to have them in a retreat or something for a couple of weeks and get them started not that you can do that but you know what i'm saying the people themselves um are are far away from understanding what's what's needed and once once they've got it yeah, certainly. I mean, hepatitis C affects the brain as well as um, the liver. Um, it does cause this so-called brain fog. Um, All right. And yeah, undoubtedly, those sort of symptoms impairs quality of life, etc. The importantly, if if people are cured, those symptoms often do improve. Um, so that's all the more reason to to really try and help those people get through treatment as as much Good. as we can. Well, that's absolutely brilliant. What you've got... Oh, there's Alf. Come on, Alf. Another... Go on, then. You need to unmute. Yeah. Um, World Hepatitis Day, is it still Is it still this year? I mean, I, I've just been checking. I know there was one in, uh, in 2022, but is there is there one in 2023? Because that obviously is on the 28th of July. And maybe we could do something in the, in the summer um, yeah. version of the newsletter. Link to that. Yeah. Definitely, that's an excellent idea. We can definitely do that. Um, absolutely, good, good plan. So, what? What? We, thanks for that, Al. Um, so, Stuart, what we've done tonight is you've given us all an insight in this. That uh, I've had my eyes open, and there, there's a net, we've got a network of networks here, and we'll spread the word, and we'll do what we can to um, to help eliminate this uh, awful disease uh, as best we can and do let us know if you need any help or oh, linda oh linda's probably clapping that's good <laughs> thank you very much thanks for that Stuart. thank you so, thanks any other questions anyone no well we'll end the meeting for all and i'll stop recording and uh, it'll be available on youtube uh, probably tomorrow okay thank you so much Stuart, for giving us thank your you. time uh, and for Suzanne. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Have a good evening.